Welcome back to Life and Style. And I looked at social media during the break and people are excited about that amazing technology that we had on Innovate earlier, Ron. So if you're still just catching up, remember the hashtag is KTN Life and Style. You can get on that on Twitter and uh, Instagram, KTN Life and School Style on Facebook, KTN Life and Style. Right now, though, we are on Motivate. And today, Wednesday, mid Thursday. Yes, Mr. Chris is in the studio. Karibu sana. Thank you. Or do a talking relationship today <laughs> no <laughs> we are on motivated we're glad to have you today so Thank we're you. all about empowering and motivating and encouraging people today right and uh, your story uh, is quite fascinating from where you started to the person that you become now and uh, even your church and you as a person like you, I, I don't know how many different uh, personalities you have to I have to drop this one here and pick up this one here when I'm the relationship guru quite a number of them <laughs> yeah quite a number of them yes uh, I think let's just start from the beginning like who's Pastor Chris and where did he begin I, I just in brief as we get on to uh, your life story you know, we were growing up um, in a family, five children, and I was, I still am, the last, right? Uh, my mother put a lot of uh, emphasis on education, um, talking about, you know, the best inheritance I can give you is education. Yeah. My father was working a bit of, uh, like, an hour away from where we were. I grew up in Kisumu. He was working somewhere else. Uh, somehow he was battling with alcohol, so we mostly were uh, raised by my mother, who tried to invest much in education, especially myself, my uh, sibling. I've got two who have passed on already. Uh, one of them was my sister. She was about two years older than, I'm, than I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the last three of us, we went into private schools. In those days, it was really something for anybody to take their kids to private schools because the public was free and people would think, why should we pay fees? Yeah. But she put it right from the beginning and said, you know what, this is the best inheritance I can give you. I don't, we don't have much, no land, no properties, no nothing. She's a, she was a school teacher uh, for about 40 years. So she oh. said, you know what, this is what I'll give you. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing she used to say is, uh, never fight using your blows. Oh. She'd say the best way to fight is with a pen. Okay. So her emphasis was really on um, education. So I grew up like that. I grew up knowing that I needed to study. I needed to, to learn, to read. Then I had my brother, uh, my third born brother. He used to come home and uh, he'd be reading these novels because now everybody around us, there was only one who was my age mate. Mm -hmm. The rest of the people were 10 years Whoa. older. Okay. That meant that I had to grow up fast lane. Uh, when they were in their teenage and I was a kid, I was being exposed to things that teenagers are uh, interested in. So my brother, who is seven years older than I was, than I am, would come home with his novels. Uh, curiosity, I would be trying to pick up those novels and read. So he introduced me to a reading culture also. <laughs> when he would be reading his novels way into the night, I would be reading the same. <laughs> By the time I'm doing primary school, I'd, I'd devoured a lot of the novels, you know. So that's a bit of the background. Then I found various gifts, art, um, I used to draw a lot, I used to love to write. Artistic Tuesday <coughs> meets Wednesday now? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's been long since I did that stuff. Okay. But, so I love to draw, um, I love to write. I was writing my poems when we were in primary school, right from primary school. And how I landed there was, I did not want to be uh, brought into a play or an, a poem mm -hmm. by the teachers because then they would dictate how I need to go for rehearsals and stuff. So I needed yeah. to have some freedom. So I decided, let me pen down something. And I wrote something in South African freedom before they had um, their freedom then. What? And we did that. So I got a few of my friends. So anytime somebody would come and say, you know what, um, we need you on this, I would say I already have a poem. But again, <laughs> my mother introduced me to the first public uh, platform. She okay. was my teacher when we were in a, a class three. And she had this poem. So she said, she took about six of us and brought us over there. So at, looking back, I think there was quite a foundation that was being laid for who I was going to be now. Mm. Uh, involvement in sports, uh, various sports, different places. So as I grew up then, I found there was, my dilemma was, where do I direct the multiple and diverse giftings yeah. that I had? Mm -hmm. uh, so we grew up then, meager resources, humble family, um, 
I went to St. Patrick's High School in Newtown because of sports, got out of there, uh, cleared. I went to college, Moy University then. Um, their campus was within Maseno. What was happening then was that the government tried to put people closer home. They were oh, trying to push everybody yeah. away. So, um, so I went to study uh, botany and zoology. What? Which is just <laughs> simply biology. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the early part of it. <laughs> did you ever get to practice? No, uh, I did not, because by the time I was coming out, I think uh, I was more ministry oriented. When I, did that I, begin? I love to say that I have a scientific mind and an artistic heart. Okay. So somehow I would still be drawn into the arts, because rarely would you find somebody in college who was studying science who was in performing the uh, arts. Okay. And I was involved in drama all the way into university level. I was involved in sports. Uh, the thinking used to be, if you're doing things like botany and zoology, you'd spend your whole life in the library. Yes, I was rarely. In the library? I was rarely in the library. Which you know. sport were you really good at? Hockey and football. Hockey? Yes. I wouldn't even. What number? Position, getting a football? Uh, in the midfield, football I was more versatile. That was the first game that we started playing. Okay. You know. Yeah, growing up from, from childhood. So that was the first. By the time I was in my form one, I was playing for the school team. What? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I did a lot of football, you know. Um, then hockey. Hockey was more like a game in Kisumu where everybody, everybody got to know how to play hockey. Um, so I did those a lot. And then a bit of uh, athletics, a bit of basketball. Um, I was just all over the place. <laughs> with those. So at what point did you decide to get into the ministry like full time? What, the whole time you were in campus, were you also like a CU in the CU or something like that? Yes, I was. I was. Uh, I wouldn't really say I wasn't in the CU. I'm, I'm, uh, I've grown up very unconventional. Oh, OK. But I was uh, reaching out to people. Um, my father died about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that was a turning point because I, I got saved while I was in school, but then there was the mix, you know, you're drawn towards uh, this new life and then you're being drawn back into certain stuff. Um, so I got myself for years away from anything ministry or church. Uh, but when he died then, um, I talked once about I had this, my whole huge reggae collection. I had about 600 tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Here we have it, finally. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, I had about 600 tapes. There were no CDs in those days. So when, when he passed on and we'd gone to the village and I was sitting over there, so we were listening to the music all through and then it hit me how life brings everybody to the base. And so the, mm -hmm. the meaning of life, um, what's the meaning of life? And that year was very, um, that year was very dramatic for me um, because my father died in January, then my maternal grandfather died in September and um, I had an experience later on that year uh, which is a bit that's too heavy when I, but I had an experience and um, that was a turning point for me to uh, follow the call and so from that point nobody needed to talk to me nobody needed to tell me anything I got a bit more involved separated myself a lot from everything that I was doing before I think it was a period that was for consecration development uh, for ministry. So I stopped playing hockey. Um, Drama. Yes, I stopped doing most of the things because now I needed to spend time mm -hmm. and uh, build me. I needed to build me. I needed to feed a lot. Um, spent a lot of time now beginning to study the word. And I did not even think that it was going to be ministry as I'm doing it right now. Yeah. It was just a hunger and I thought I'm doing that for me, you know. But then out of it, I'd find myself going around and uh, ministering to people one-on-one. -on -one. I did that a lot, you know. Uh, I would do that way into midnight, 1 a.m. I, I would leave my room open till 4 a.m. for wow. anybody who's in college who wanted to come. And the people- That was ministry right there, you know. It was. <laughs> but it did was. you realize what you were doing? Well, uh, with time I saw that. Yeah. And it is people who were not even in the CU, who were not even born again, who started, they say that room is the room of power. <laughs> You know, because um, there was there would be all kinds of stuff happening over there. People would come in drunk and say, "I want to get saved." Uh, people would come in who are depressed. They pray for me. People who I did not even know. 
Um, so that's, that's how it started over there. Then eventually going back into the holidays, uh, going back to Kisumu, then got into a church over there, started serving, ministered, got into a praise and worship team. So I was balancing between the word you ministry. You can also sing, Pastor Chris. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do that right now. I know we ambush you a lot. But yeah, yeah those are very many talents uh, put together and in one person. And for you to just stop doing all of those things for a particular uh, you know, duration of time. And then, you know, did you ever try to get back to doing those things? Because I'm sure you loved them, like yes, playing yes. in the arts. You know, initially, and especially um, after college life, then you're trying to find, uh, here I was trying to find direction for my mm. life. Which way am I supposed to go? Yeah. Um, so I thought, which one of the talents that I have am I supposed to major on? Mm. I thought, do I do writing? You know, when I was in primary school, I was doing my own newsletter. So I'd write about guys and things that are happening within the school, then everybody gives me a shilling for reading. <laughs> it would just be three full scraps. And then I'd draw. Uh, I would draw my pictures, I'd draw the cartoons. I used to read way back people like Whispers. I used to love the Ali Mazrui articles, all of yeah. that. So uh, I'd want to do the same thing. I'd want to do the same thing. So I'd be writing and then everybody gives me a shilling in a class of 40 people. Just to people. read and yes. bring it back. Yes, Aye. and you pass it around. <laughs> That's entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah, clearly, at a very young age. Uh -huh. Yes. So at some point I was battling with that, like what am I supposed to do? Um, I think for me, one of the greatest strengths has been the flow of creative energy. Mm -hmm. So I'd always come up with these ideas and I'm thinking, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, there are times I tried to go back into art, uh, but by then it wasn't as appreciated mm -hmm. as it is right now. Yeah. So you'd look at it and think, can I really make a living out of this? Um, so I tried to go diverse ways, but then I kept on finding myself being drawn back into what I'm doing now. Okay. Um, but having found my footing again in ministry and with time, then I found the other avenues are opening up again. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Now, you were doing this from the confines of your room and then you went home, uh, joined the church. At what point did you decide to start? Now, I need to lead a group of people, start my own church, find a following and mentor them to the many different branches that you have right now. Well, I, I tried to run away from that for a very long time. Okay. For a very long time, because um, I've spent about 20 years in ministry and our church is only six years old to tell you that for 14 years, I was nowhere near doing church. Uh, by the time I was getting to doing church, I was, I was trying to run away from this country. I went down to South Africa. I thought most of Why? the things weren't working trying? over here. Oh. In, yes. <laughs> in terms of ministry, I'm a Yes, in terms of ministry. I, I thought that my ministry would not be received well over here. Why? I'm not, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll just go into it. You see, yes. you see, at a certain point, there was quite a shift where you find most people's association with ministry, even now, and I know even for you, when you first meet, this is Pastor Chris, so you're, the first people you're thinking about are the kind of people that you've seen on media okay. uh, doing kind of stuff. Yeah. And it seemed like that was the only way to make it or be part of a large denomination. So those of us who could not do the drama, the gimmicks, it seemed like the system was against us in a sense. And I thought, you know what? I, I was traveling a lot for years and I thought, um, if I go back to South Africa, I'd been going to South Africa a lot. I said, if I go back to South Africa, I've got a lot of people who appreciate what I do yeah. over there. So I wanted to go there for about a period of one year. Uh, everything in my life had seemed like it was shut. So we were going through emotional, we were going through financial uh, difficulty. Then I just lost my sister. Then she was my closest sibling. And then everything financial was dried up. Um, I wanted to take care of her children. She had three children. I needed to take care of my mother. I had a family of my own. And we, my wife has always been with me, mostly in ministry. And I was thinking, how am I going to do all of this? Mm -hmm. So I thought, let me go to South Africa and resettle uh, over there. But then God spoke to me when I was in South Africa, said, go back home. So it was a battle for me. I spent about three, four weeks over there battling with it. And I'm thinking, I've just come from there. And he said, go back home and begin doing church. So when I tell my wife that that was not a plan then, because we were even in debt at that point. And what, what most people don't realize is when you begin church, it's like you're beginning a business. You are going to invest your money, your energy, your time. Yeah. 
um, unless you're branching out from a denomination that is going to support you. So beginning a church would mean that uh, we were going to have pressure on our finances, and I did not want that. The second thing I did not want, I never wanted to rely on congregants for my upkeep. Mm. I never wanted to be standing over there and have to rely on people like they're paying their tithes and their offerings, and I've never wanted to need from people. So I was battling with that, and my wife was also battling with that. So we started doing, um, I came back, and uh, we started doing just a teachings on Saturdays. We had nothing when we were starting. I was in debt. So then later on, some things begin to open up, and I was clearing debt. I was busy clearing all the debt that I had little by little, and I got a hall somewhere and started doing teachings on Saturdays. The first group that we had was 13 people. I didn't have instruments. I didn't have nothing. Uh, we couldn't even afford to do publicity. But the passion, the passion to do this because of the strength of the call. I remember my son had to stay home for about a month. Actually a month, he stayed home. And I was battling with him. I said, God, you know what? Um, every time I do stuff with you, I'm always in a mess. And I'm <laughs> thinking, so why? Why should my son stay home just because I'm doing the work you called me to do? Yeah. Um, so we would do that. I, I would have to go uh, borrow equipment from somebody in Kitengela, drive, pick my children. We were living in Mbakasi area then, then go to the service every Saturday, then do that. When we finished, then I drop the things in Kitengela, get back home. You know, so the whole day would be taken, kids crying, um, they're hungry, they're tired, but that was our life then when we were beginning. So eventually then we got a place to start on a Sunday, the 2nd of January, 2011, and we were 20 of us. And um, that's how the journey began in Harlingham. <laughs> That is quite the story, and I'm sure it's it, that was just hard beginning. But I'm sure you've you've you've, you've had challenges all along the way, and yes. um, <laughs> some will be common to like all churches, or probably all kinds of congregations that people come together to worship. Some will be unique to just your church. What would those be? Well, I think the greatest challenge that a leader uh, would face when you're a leader, the greatest challenge is um, to be deserted at a particular point, mm. um, especially when people do not understand the passion and the vision that you do carry. Um, most people love to come into things that are already set and established. They don't like to come into things that mean it is work. Mm. So when they come in and they find that it is not as established as they thought, mm. they quickly leave. Um, the other thing is that when you're a church leader, a uh, pastor, and I did open my house to people, we used to have like seven, eight, um, six church members coming into our house every weekend. Uh, one time I was driving a van and no, I had to do two trips to church because of the number of people who were in my house. And uh, you get attached to the people and then one day they wake up and they walk out and your children are asking you where is so and so. And yeah. they don't realize that when they came into your life, it was more than you. It was also your children. So when they're walking away, these children, uh, they don't know where to get their answers from. You mm -hmm. know, um, So I realized and I learned that the most important part of the church for me is my family because, and I tell them that even in church, I say, you know, people can find another church, but my family only has me. Yeah. My children will never find another father. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife only has me. So as much as I want ministry to do well and to grow, and that's something that most of the people who are trying to build business or grow churches are battling with, sometimes they put a lot of emphasis on the growth that they forget their families. And, you know, if everybody walked out on me and my wife is still with me, I'm fine. Yeah. If she walks out on me right now, it's like everybody did walk out. So those, those are some things that you deal with. You deal with the, the, the issues of uh, resources, putting in your own money. Sometimes mm -hmm. you deny yourself, you deny your children. You pay uh, your children's fees late because you want to do a program or you want to do a, a project in church. Uh, you'll deny them time over the weekend because you're meeting people sometimes in the evenings. Uh, you've got to be there for other people. So you're healing other families while you're neglecting yours. You're raising other people's children while probably yours are not uh, getting attention from you. You're giving money outside more than inside. Yeah. My wife has been very supportive for me because uh, I put a lot of resource in ministry. And sometimes that means that, uh, that would mean those days that I would come home uh, and not have carried a dress. <laughs> you know, the passion that a man has, um, 
really crazy. So you've got to have a balance over there, but those are usually challenges. Yeah. Um, when you're a startup, no matter what startup it is, when you're a startup, before you break even, uh, that's really crazy, usually very difficult in terms of resources, in terms of knowing who am I with. Um, Ministry-wise, people volunteer to serve. It's not like a job where yeah. you'll write a memo and yeah. everybody has got to go in line. Yeah. So developing people who are loyal to the vision, who have clarity of vision, who want the same things that you want, mm -hmm. they have different personalities, temperaments, and to get them to work together and they're not seeing any direct benefit or immediate uh, yeah. in terms of material or something, mm -hmm. that takes a lot of skill in there. Then you get to learn also that, you know, people are not the way they look. Um, the, the sometimes you're battling with the child in them. Yeah. They may have a very high position in society, but then when you deal with them very close, you're battling with a child in them. So you'll find a 40-year-old who really acts like a 14-year-old, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that happens. Let's talk about the now. Uh, your church has grown. It has many branches. Uh, not many. We're only six. <laughs> six, is, oh, six is not many? No. <laughs> Considering where you said, that, that's a good start. That's yes, good yes, yes. Where are these branches? Uh, we have Mombasa. We're in uh, Siokimao, which is um, where our main church currently is. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the city center um, in a place called Nasiko. Nasiko uh, in the city center that is next to Taskis Beba Beba. We're in Mombasa, Bliss Hotel in Nyali. We are in Nyahururu. They made it a social center. We are in Meru, somewhere in Makutano. Mm -hmm. Then we started just a few months ago in Pretoria. In South the, Africa. The, the, the South African dream came to fruition. Yes, <laughs> yes, it did. Through the people now uh, that that we've raised, one of the things I've been passionate about is to raise leaders. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we've got those six currently. So, Pastor Chris, you have an event going on uh, at Tiokimau. Yes, uh, right now. Yes, come on, we talked about it, and hyped it, and it's been amazing. How's it going? Going very well, uh, mm. very delighted. We've had a uh, great, great, great ministry going on. Kabod has been going on for, this is the fourth year, mm -hmm. and it keeps on growing bigger and better. We pull in all kinds of people. This year we've got, uh, even tonight, we have Dr. Wale, who is a marketplace person. Yeah. Um, we've got uh, Elias Ndedo. Uh, he's doing both churches and the marketplace in South Africa. We have heard Dr. Alberto Dulele. He's a medical doctor, but he still pastors a church and he practices still. Uh, then we've got, uh, we've had uh, Apostle Ivan Zababu, uh, who runs a church within Nairobi also, and is in the corporate to motivational speaking. We've had uh, Hlengiwe Ndombela from South Africa as a gospel uh, musician. Mm -hmm. um, she came with her husband, Sia, and uh, Sia is the music director, Joy Celebration. Ah, wow. Yeah, which is very huge. Yes, which it is. Which is very huge. And we were so glad that this was the second year coming in. So glad that in the midst of a lot of activity right now, they're preparing to record Joy's 21 together with the Porter's House in live in Dallas. They still would honor this invitation. This really so big, that is yeah. very huge. And then we've got Mahalia uh, Buchanan, who begins tomorrow. Friday, she begins to minister all the way. One of the biggest names that has come out of That's South African true. gospel right now. Yeah. Uh, so we're doing that at our church in Silky Mao every evening. There is absolutely no fee. I think when people have seen, you know, <laughs> they, they see, see the flyer. the artists there, they think. Uh, and the speakers, happy. they're thinking like, how, how much? much? No. The only much you need to pay is either the fuel to drive your car or the fare to get to Silky Mao. That's, That's all. Yeah. And then you bring yourself as a living sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but our church is located uh, along Katani Road. Mm -hmm. Off, off what? Uh, yeah, off Mombasa Road. Then you use the service lane from Gateway Mall. Uh, then you get to Katani Road, which is the last entry into Sukimau. It's the only tarmac right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting for Alfred Mutua to do <laughs> what he <Yeah>. said. <laughs> but then, uh, then you get to Flappy Car Wash after the 360 houses. You get to Flappy Car Wash and you turn right. You will see this church, which is half glass and then um, half orange. Half yes. glass, half orange. Yes. There you have it. Now you know where you need to be uh, this uh, tonight. 
tonight all the way till Sunday. Till Sunday. Yes. From Ilianza Sunday. Sunday to Sunday. Sunday to Sunday. It's been. Yeah. It's going to be eight days of amazing, amazing fellowship at uh, New Birth Covenant uh, Church. Um, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And we, you know, you get it. I, I, I right, know. I'm not say I, it's okay. I know I'm invited, <laughs> and I'm going to make sure I'm there before, before, before Sunday. How about all right. that? Okay, I'll yeah. be watching out for you. Okay. You you had your own challenges uh, starting and setting it up, and uh, you at this point where things are working, church is growing, new branches everywhere. How are we giving back to the society as a person, as a family, as a church? As a person, I do run mentorship programs. Um, remember my, my foundation. My mother told me that the greatest inheritance I will ever give you is education. education. When you educate people, you empower them to live. I love to say that you need to make people be able to live without you being present. And uh, that's not money. That's not money. You gotta put something in them. It's not mm. what you give, what you leave with them that is important. It's what you leave in them. You gotta put something in the people that if you ever take away everything that they have, they can still draw out from within themselves and produce something. You know, when God created, he created with nothing around him. He pulled from inside. That's just how we go about it. So I run mentorship programs. Uh, I've got something called Hope Forum. That is for people in colleges trying to develop leaders over there. So we'll always get them uh, together. We send them the money, all the uh, vehicles to bring them to a location that we will be and take care of them the whole day. We don't take no offerings for that. We, we give them snacks or lunch and then empower them like the whole day. Been doing that from 2013. Um, and, and that is a starting point for us. I also have been doing something with men for quite a number of years. Then sometimes we will go into prisons. That is part of our activities. We'll go into prisons. We will go and give them blankets. We will go and give them uh, things that they need over there. Mm -hmm. um, then as a church, then uh, we started going to the children's homes mm -hmm. and just trying to do that. But we we also about to establish another program where we will be having a feeding program for children who come from the slums initially once in a month. But as they come in, the greatest investment you can make in people is to educate them. Yes. And education is not just formal. Mm -hmm. It's spend time with them, change their mindset, exposure, Exposure just changes somebody's world. Sometimes exposure does more than formal education will because exposure gets somebody to see possibilities. Um, they see things that they see the breaking of limitations. Somebody can have papers and not be able to live life. Then you That's bring true. somebody else into a place where they can live life. One of the things I love to do with people is to give them that exposure. I love to do that. Uh, if it means I will put somebody on a flight for the first time, mm -hmm. just for them to have that experience. If it means I need to give somebody a five-star treatment uh, just for a while, just to change their mindset. So I love to do stuff like that because I know what that does to a person. Self-belief will make somebody break walls no matter how hard or high they are. There's so many things that you're doing right now. All of those things, the ministry, your family. What is it that you like to do when you're not doing all of that, like pastime activities, hobbies, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> there had to be something juicy. We need to know, Pastor Chris. Well, I love to travel. Mm -hmm. I love to listen to music. Uh, I love to watch football. In fact, Sunday afternoons, uh -huh. when I'm through with church, I want to go watch football. I, I just want to get my head off from stuff. Uh, or probably go out and sit and eat with the boys. Some, the, I've got three boys. Uh, two of them r run my life. You know, they'll dictate stuff. It's like you owe them for taking them to church. So now, uh, you have after to pay that, back. Yeah, you got to pay back and you got to do that. But I love watching them, how they are growing, how they are being. So I love to travel. I love to listen to music, uh, visit different places. And I started doing that a while back. While we were dating with my wife, we loved to sample every kind of restaurant. We just believed that all things are possible, yeah. uh, with, even without money. And that's the same belief that I carry right now. Yeah. Okay. Nice to know. Now, you are Pastor Chris. Yes. You, 
this is this is okay definitely this is okay uh but you have to handle other people's issues and you have to talk about relationships and stuff that people are going through what would you say was the like the hardest or the most difficult uh thing for you to do or switch or role to be when you started being on life and style and uh, handling relationship Wednesdays you know, initially, and uh, I did ask myself when this was coming in, I was asking myself, do I want to move from the comfort of, uh, of, of church yeah. world yeah. into um, this, this different world? Uh, because I'd been doing things like Leadership Forum, um, those ones, and being a guest on different shows everywhere, um, doing things like Commandia Morning, Tukuza, doing things in other places. That was a bit easier. Yeah. So I was asking myself, uh, do I really want to do this? One, because you're already thinking, uh, some people just get hostile with you for no reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, do I want to expose myself to that? Um, then again, now I move from the place where this is the, my most comfortable place to sit. <laughs> now I move to the place where I've got to sit over there yes. and, and, and develop the content and get the guests. And that has been a growing process for me. Um, I've had a lovely time though, you know, growing great team, great producers, great crew, uh, making it easy for me, yeah. not making me feel like, hey, what are you doing over here? Your world is the other world. So it's, it's really been good for me though. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do exactly what you do right now. So Pastor Chris, look into that <laughs> camera. <laughs> <laughs> Encourage someone today. <laughs> yeah? yeah? You know, dreams are seeds and seeds never grow until they're planted. You will never know how big something will become until you begin to do it. There's no better way to start than to start. If you never start, you will never know what it could have been. So you've got to break the fear of beginning. Most people want to see the end, but then the end is a process. You, you've got to have the picture of the end, but then you've got to get back to the beginning, then begin to walk towards the end. When a movie is being developed, they start from the end, then they develop a story. And that's how your life is, your vision, your dream, is the end of it. That's how it's supposed to end. But go back to the beginning and begin to write the story. And the best place to start is right now. The best person to start with is you. Yeah. The best things to begin with are what you have around you. Don't wait for something else to come from around you, from afar. Don't wait for anybody to validate your dream or anybody to support your dream. Just start from where you are with what you have. Look for what you can do and break forth. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. Thank you for having me. Yes. This will only <laughs> happen once. This is it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Contacts? <laughs> okay, dear, I swear. <laughs> well, uh, you know, follow me on Twitter, at yes. CJ Atemo. Uh -huh. um, Facebook, Chris J. Atemo. And you could, you could like our page on Facebook, Chris Atemo School of Leadership. Um, that's where I put my leadership content. So uh, like that page right over there. But uh, my number, that's our ministry line, is 721 Five five six one five nine zero seven two one five five six one five nine. That's our ministry line. You can get right. in touch. Thank you so much, Pastor. All right. Chris. All right. There you have it. The best person to start whatever it is that you want to start is you. You, you do not expect someone else to come and tell you. That will not be possible. So it's up to you to go ahead and dare to dream and actually try and bring that dream to reality. This has been motivated with Pastor Chris taking a very short commercial break. When we come back, books and blogs. Yes, we are all about inspiration, even if we're getting them from books or blogs. Catherine Wangi is ready for you. You and of course, restaurant of the week coming up shortly. So we are saying, when it comes to Isabella Kamau, the way we know you is a romance writer. Yeah. Period. 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 Yeah. And I would want my readers to get something that will just relax them. Yeah. Uh, something that will, uh, something interesting. 